Okay, play along with me for a minute. When you see an image, let's just imagine that in your dream, you're having a dream and you wake up, or, or you don't wake up, but you're in, you find yourself in a location. Um, the first location you find yourself in looks like this. Do you know why you're there? Okay, come on, why are we there? You're eating, right? Okay, next picture is, where, why are you there? To sw okay, come on guys, let's go, wake up. <laughs> It's not that hard. You're there to swim, right? Okay, what about this picture? Why are we here? Good. I think the first service thought it was a trick question. It's not a trick question. <laughs> um, we are here to worship. We are here to be in community together. We are here, as we say around here, we're here to help all people know, follow, and share Jesus. And that means when we gather together, there's an invitation to experience God's grace, to, to encounter the living God who invites us into relationship with his son, Jesus, through his son, Jesus, that we get to follow him, that there's a rhythm to life that we model that brings life to not only to us, but to the world around us. And, and we get to share the goodness of God in many ways in word and deed, and this is why we are here, and this is what we have been talking about in this series, POOR is an acronym that invites us into the rhythms of life that allow us, that invite us to do the things, to be the church, to be the followers of Jesus, and then to band together to, to fulfill the mission of God in the world that, that all would know and follow and share Jesus. Um, POOR is an acronym. It's an acronym that's that's really soaked in our history as a, a Methodist church, as it's part of the line of John Wesley. John Wesley was the, uh, the, the, the uh, person who began, he was an Anglican priest who grew up in the church. And he came to a point in his life where he realized that, that he had all the outward forms of religion, that he was kind of going through all of the motions, but he had not really experienced a transforming encounter with the grace of God that had changed his life and sent him on real mission. He realized a lot of, bless you, he realized a lot of people were just going through the motions in life and in the church, and, and God began a fire, lit a fire in him that spread around the world and transformed the world. And so he, you could say Wesley was emptied and God poured his spirit into to him and to the early Methodists. They, they met in this abandoned cannonball foundry. That was the first place they met. It was, a, 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 it had burned down and, and it was a place where King Charles, where armament was formed and fashioned and melted, metals were melted and purified to become useful for the army in England. And Wesley moved in and, and I love the imagery, right? Because it became a place where men and women were forged through the Holy Spirit to be useful for God in his kingdom. And so in this series, we're introducing an acronym, POOR, to help us live into these rhythms of life that Jesus calls us to. P is for pray. Pray uh, continually that God will show us how to be a blessing to our world, that he'll show us uh, how to reach out and to love and to bless others around us. And a lot of us, I know, are intimidated by prayer if we're new in our faith journey. Uh, listen, prayer doesn't have to be intimidating. You can pray simple prayers like, God, show me where you are today. God, show me somebody that needs your grace. So, show me somebody that I can bless today. Show me what you're doing in my world and help me to be a part of it. O is offer, and this is really offer an invitation to relationship. And so we've talked about how sharing a meal together and in connecting with others, inviting others into our home, being a little bit more aware of, of, of the people that God has put in close proximity to us in these key areas of influence, where we live, where we work, where we study if we're students, or where we play in our places in the community. And you know, I was thinking about that last one. You know, when I was, when my kids were younger, they were always at sporting events. They were doing their thing. And so uh, one of the places that I saw God open up doors and relationships that I still have today was as I coached kids, um, I got to know uh, the families on the teams. And that was really an important place. Now, my kids are older now, and it feels different. And, but I got a new puppy the other day, right? 
I'm starting to feel like a grandpa a little bit. Um, but, but the place that we've been hanging out lately is the dog park because this dog's just nuts, like been just going crazy, puppy, you know, energy. And so the, a few weeks ago, I was at the dog park and I met a couple there and we started conversation and I realized like in the moment, I caught myself, I'm like, oh, I'm the preacher and I'm supposed to do what I tell people to do, right? This is the, this is kind of, the dilemma for us, right? If we say it, we have to do it. And I realized like I've been going so fast, I haven't been maybe practicing the rhythms of Jesus. And so I, I did, I intentionally like thought, God, that maybe there's an intersection here. And I struck up a conversation with somebody at the dog park, it was a couple, and, and, I, and, and we started to talk and eventually they asked me what I do. Now we have a rule at our, when we meet new people, we always try to make sure they do not know that I'm a pastor until they've cussed at least twice. That's, that's like our general goal because that tells us, you know, that it's always fun. Number one, when they realize that, you know, they dropped an F-bomb in front of the preacher. Um, <laughs> But they also see how I don't overreact and see me as a real person is my hope and my goal. And so um, I'm not saying these people did that. I'm just saying they eventually did find out that I was a pastor. And we started talking about Foundry and they said, oh, and I said, um, I, I said something about Pastor Andy and, um, and, past, and they said, oh, we know him. And Pastor Luis, oh, we know him too. And so I was like, I got home and I texted Andy and Luis and I said, hey, I met this couple at the park and they know you. And I was, you know, I was doing poor. I was neighboring. And they said, oh yeah, what's her name? What's their name? And I was like, oh man, <laughs> I'm really not doing very well at poor right now. And, and so, I, but I pray in that moment, it was like a humbling moment where I realized, you know, this is a lesson, right? In, in the fact that God gives us second chances. And so I wanna give you, I wanna give you, I wanna help you to understand that this is not a short-term thing, okay? And so if it doesn't go right the first time, or don't think of this series as ending today because poor is an ongoing rhythm that we're inviting you into. And so I just prayed, God, give me another chance, Give me another chance. So I went back to the dog park the next day, and there they are again. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. And I was just looking for the opportunity to pretend that I already knew their name, but to remember and get their name, and I did. And this time I wrote it down in, in my phone, you know, and that's the point of the maps that you have in your poor guides, is that as you begin to do these things, like I have a whole list now of people that I've met at the dog park and things that they like and where they're from and their, and, you know, like it, it just took me a little, I knew all these things, but it took me a little intentionality to live into them. And I wanna encourage you to keep growing and don't give up in this, okay? Offer invitations to relationships, connect with people, learn names as you pray. And then as you will, what's starting to happen for me with some of those people is that I'm starting to understand needs. I'm starting to hear, and that's what you is. Understand the needs of the people in your lives um, that God crosses your path with. What are their hurts? You know, what are their... What are their passions? What do they love? What do they, how can you connect over shared interests so that God can begin to reveal how he is working in their lives? Because here's the deal. They're not projects. They're people. They're people that God, though, wants to pour his grace out through you in their lives to bless them. You're not an evangelist on the corner with a bullhorn. That's not what we're inviting. You don't be freaked out by this idea of sharing your faith. It's simply by blessing others and listening to the needs in their lives and then under seeking to understand them. That's why this workshop, I wanna encourage you to come when Pastor Andy and Louise pre, um, teach the workshop, uh, Word and Deed. And then, because it helps you to respond in Word and Deed. R is to respond in word and deed as you get to know people and their story and their needs and how God is working. And so today as we wrap up, I wanna turn to the book of Titus because I believe that for our day and our time, God has a message that will kind of tie this whole thing up and help us to see why it's so important and why we wanna live this out. And so turn to the book of Titus. Uh, on your phones, in your Bible app, in the Bible, if you have one with you. We're gonna look at Titus 2, chapter 2, um, and verse uh, 11 in just a second. But I wanna set this up with a little culture, uh, a little context about the culture um, where, uh, where Titus is serving. Titus was, 
One of Paul's uh, partners in ministry, they had planted churches together, and in particular, Paul commissioned Titus to the island of Crete, okay? It's one of the Grecian islands, it's southernmost, and it's one of the largest ones. And Crete was a very important place for ministry for Paul and, and for Titus as he's commissioned there because of all the seaports that were on the island that Paul knew that if the gospel took root in Crete, that it would, it would spread throughout the, the world. And so he sends Titus there and, 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 they, and they start this church, but they're, uh, and when Titus goes, he's there, he's going to address some issues that they're having. Don't think of the early church as being perfect and having it all figured out, because it was a big mess. And, uh, and, and people are trying to figure out how, how to do life as followers of Jesus when they've come from something totally different. And it's important to know that, because if the Christian culture was dominated by sexual immorality and indulgences of all kind. The core values of the Christian culture, you could say, were selfish gain and manipulation. And so they valued and celebrated a person who had the ability to get what they wanted from others by any means necessary. And so Christians were coming to Christ and wrestling, you can imagine, if that's your worldview and you've lived in that and then you're, you're coming to Christ, you're, you're having a difficult time making sense of, of your old identity and your new identity and how you live. And so they were, they were adapting and, and seeking to live out their faith, but there were false teachers teaching them different ways to do this, and they were reacting in, I would say, two different ways that were unhelpful. First is they were, they were retreating, they were leaving, they were, they were abandoning those urban centers where people uh, were doing life. They were, they were moving out of the public square because they thought, well, if we just remove ourselves from this corrupt society, then we can live a pure, holy life, right? But by doing that, they were losing all influence to pour out the grace of God where they were. The other thing that was happening, though, on the other side of the spectrum is that many were trying to assimilate into the culture. And so they were kind of taking a little of this old life and blending it with a little bit of the Christian life. But when the culture was what I said it was, when they celebrated, for instance, that, that kind of their hero, their cultural icon was the god Zeus, and that Zeus was known as being a womanizer and a manipulator later, and that he would do anything, he would use his God power to do anything, to get anything for himself, to gain more power, to gain uh, more by any means of manipulation, and he was immortalized for this, it, when you try to mix that with the Christian message that Jesus came, emptied himself, and gave up his rights, and died on a cross to bring life to others, when his whole life was this generous outflowing of grace, how do you blend those two worldviews together? They don't work together. And here's, here's the point I'm making is, any time as followers of Jesus, we are always going to face this in some way, that the way of Jesus, the way of scripture, is always gonna be contrary to the ways of this world in some ways that there's going to always be a rub between worldly values and godly values. And yet the answer is not to run away, to run for the hills. God wants us to live in close proximity to people who are far from God. God has put you in your neighborhood to be a blessing to people who don't believe the same things that you believe. The, 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 the goal is not to assimilate in such a way that you look just like everybody else though. On the outside, on the surface, in common interest, yeah, maybe, maybe, you know, it doesn't mean, well, I became a Christian, so now I'm not gonna be a, a sports fan anymore. It doesn't mean that we, like, get rid of everything that we loved before because part of being a, a witness in the world is connecting with people over shared interest. And so how do you, but, but that doesn't define you any longer and you're willing to live in a different way in that where maybe on the outside, you, your family, your home, you kind of, you look the, the same. People, you have rapport with people, but as they press a little deeper into relationship, they start to notice that you live a little bit different, that there's a different value system that you live by. 
And this is what Paul wants to get through to Timothy. He's giving him instructions for how to deal with a conniving, power-hungry, manipulative kind of culture full of all kinds of indulgence, and he's trying to bring the message of Christ to them. And so he says to, to Titus, he gives them him these instructions to live it out, to help the Christians there, but also the church to be transformed into the image of God, God in these ways. So verse 11, chapter 2. Okay, you got some context now. You ready to jump in? For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. God's grace initiates no matter how far from God you think you are. God comes to us and God sends us into the world to offer this grace. This is a generous grace. Look at Jesus' life. Jesus does not retreat. Jesus doesn't retreat. Jesus doesn't run for the hills. Jesus storms the gates of hell. Jesus comes into the brokenness of this world. Now, Jesus does go away to pray. We talked about that in the first week, right? But there's a rhythm to Jesus' life where he goes away to be filled by the Spirit, not to stay there. That is not where he's fulfilling the mission. But he's gonna be filled with the Spirit of God. He's going to, away to quiet places on a regular basis. Yes, there's this rhythm, but why? So that he can engage in the mission that God has for him, which ultimately leads him to laying his life down, to sacrificing everything. And so this is what it looks like when generous grace comes to us. And we are invited to this same kind of rhythm. Jesus doesn't hide from the shadows, but he brings light. He also doesn't assimilate. He doesn't become like the normal uh, uh, he doesn't embrace the normal values of this world, but he shines light and the darkness will flee. People will recognize light when they see it, when there's something generous and good and merciful that's offering you life. You understand that. You're compelled. You're drawn to it. And this is grace coming to us. And this is how God works in us. Paul continues, it, God's grace, he's talking about God's grace, teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. The same grace that draws near to us also calls God's people to say no to the corrupt ways of this world that are inconsistent with the generous love of God. This is where the rub always is, right? That there is a different pattern, a different way of life that the Holy Spirit invites us into. He goes on, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness. That's not his goal, that we stay there, but that we be transformed and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. You see, he's making us right with God. He's purifying us, washing us clean, removing sin from us, transforming us, not just so that we'll be good little Christians, but so that we will be a light in the world like he is. So when we turn to chapter three, there's this poetic, there's this compelling appeal for the followers, the followers of Jesus to live out the gospel through the power of the spirit, where we live, work, study, and play, in our spheres of influence, drawing near like Jesus draws near, being incarnational, being the presence of Jesus in our world. But we gotta understand who we are and why we've been called to this. It starts with his grace. It's all about his grace. And his grace comes to us and his grace moves through us. In verse three, chapter three, verse three. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Now listen, this is our story Paul's painting a picture of our story as followers of Jesus. And, and for some of us, this resonates more than others, maybe. For some of us, we can remember a time in our lives where we walked in these things of darkness. It's not hard for us to imagine. We, we have this testimony, and it's, it's a little more radical or, 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 or profound, seemingly, 
But I would say also, even if you have lived in the church your whole life and, and God's transforming work has taken place gradually over the course of your life, it can sometimes seem like you don't have a story. You don't have the same testimony that somebody else. And let me just encourage you that this is all of our stories. It just gets revealed and shown to us in different ways. And it will speak to different people in different ways. Because here's the truth. Without God's grace, you would not be any of the good things that resemble his spirit. If there's generosity in you, it comes from God. If there's mercy and forgiveness in you, it comes from his spirit. And without his spirit alive and at work in you, you might not point to a day when it all radically changed, but let me just tell you, there was a day and there was a version of you that would have been all these things Paul says. And so we need to recognize that it's because of his grace which has appeared to us. And I want you to be able to tell that story. Again, September 11th, I wanna encourage you to come to the workshop Sign up online because we need to get better at telling our story. The, the workshop's intended for you to be able to tell your story of Christ's work in you. If you wrestle to know what that is, we want you to be able to articulate that in a way that blesses other people. We also wanna help you to learn to use the gifts that God has given you. What are the spiritual gifts that God's blessed you with? What are the experience that, God, that you can use to, to share with others? What are the gifts that, that you have and the ways that you can serve? And so we're gonna dive into all that. Let me encourage you to come. At one time we were, though. This is our story. At one time we were foolish, disobedient, enslaved to sin. Again, Cretan culture, Cretan culture was notorious in the ancient world for all of these things. And Paul knows this. He knows that their, their cities were dangerous and, were, and sexual immorality was rampant. And he's... He's, in, he's imploring with them to live out the, the message of God's redeeming grace that meets them in that, that they are never too far. They've never been too far from God's grace. This is who they are. This is who we are, with, yet without the grace of God. But for the God, grace of God, that's what we would be. That's what he says next, actually. He says, but when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. God initiates, he saves us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. But then God appeared. But God is maybe, maybe those are the two most profound words that we could utter. The gospel is contained in these two words, but God. Paul said it in Ephesians 2, but God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved. At one time, you and I were foolish and disobedient and enslaved to sin, but God poured his grace out on us. We were disoriented and blind, but God has opened our eyes. And he continues to open our eyes daily through his mercy, through his grace. But God is rich in mercy and does not count our sins against us. We were lost and completely unable to save ourselves. But God, who is faithful and kind, saves us through his work on the cross. We were dead in trespasses. But God, who is generous in grace, has saved us not because of our good works, but because of his mercy and his righteousness. This is the gospel of Jesus, friends, that we were dead in our sin, that we have fallen short, but the God who knew no sin came to us and he poured himself out for us. This is good news, friends. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, catch this, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Grace comes to us. Grace gives us rebirth and renewal. It brings us to life. This world is a broken place. We should not be surprised by the brokenness in our world, but God has decided to use his people, the church, not the institution, but the followers of Jesus filled with the Holy Spirit to be a blessing, to be poured out. And so our, our story, you could say, comes in three parts. At one time, we were. You fill in the blank. 
but God poured out grace on us and has rescued us. And now God pours out grace through us. Listen, friends, you weren't just saved from something, you were saved for something. You weren't just saved because of his mercy to, to you know, it's not just fire insurance. <laughs> it's not just a free ticket to heaven. If you have a pulse, God has a purpose for your life. And it is to continue to proclaim this message of a God who comes to us in his grace and transforms us. And he wants you to empty yourself out and receive his grace so that you can be filled with the Holy Spirit and pour out your life for others. But God, who is rich in mercy, calls us as his followers to be that kind of church where other people might say, if it weren't for those people filled with God's grace. I was thinking about that in my own life. Who were the people? You know, I had a fourth grade Sunday school teacher who really should have quit. Because I was so like, I mean, me and my friends, we were ADHD, every other letter. You can imagine, throw them all in there together. Like she, I mean, this was one of my grandma's friends, right? That just said, I'll sign up, I'll teach fourth graders. She had, she had no, like, I would, now looking back, I would not have blamed her for just walking out, Okay? Amen. Some of you know me. You're like, amen. Okay. What my youth, my youth leaders, volunteer youth leaders who would come with donuts every week just so that we would show up for, for Bible study, right? The donuts probably didn't help with that other stuff, but, but, but they did, right? They invested in us. When, we were in, when I was in college and trying to figure out who I who I was and what my life was gonna be about and what it meant to follow Jesus as I moved into adulthood. The church that I started going to, there was a guy who invited me to stay with their family for the summer when I didn't have a place to stay. And as I did life with them, I saw what it looked like to be a, a husband and a dad and to follow Jesus as a man of God. And if it weren't for those influences in my life, where would I be? But for the church, might somebody say, but for those people. And it really doesn't matter that anybody could name us. What if you could make that kind of difference in somebody's life? I read the story of Lee Strobel recently. Lee was a, a, a reporter for the Chicago Tr Tribune. He was an a, a, a open atheist, agnostic, and his wife was radically converted to Christianity and she drug him to church and he said, I went with her because she told me I was going with her and I showed up, but I had my hypocrite antennas up when I came in because I figured if I could discredit Christians who were just playing church, going through the motions, if I could discredit them, then I could discredit Christianity. That was his mentality. And surprisingly to him, when he showed up, that's not what he found. He found people, not perfect people, but imperfect people who were seeking to know and to struggle with the things of faith. And they didn't pretend to have all the answers together, but they were gonna love each other. And they were gonna turn to God's word and they were gonna seek God. And they wanted to know God and to follow God and to share God with the world. And he said it transformed his view of what Christianity was really all about and his heart opened and he became a believer over time. As he really, as he really, you see it was the people that led him to research the claims of Christ. He was hung up on the claims of Christ. But he never would have done the research if it hadn't been for the people who loved him. They didn't provide the answers for him but they opened the door for the Holy Spirit to do that, and today he's one of the leading voices and has written, authored many, many books designed to help skeptics wrestle with the faith. His testimony is one of but God. Dead in his sin, but God showed up through the church, through God's people, and I believe that's the kind of church God wants us to be. This is our story. We are witnesses of these things, friends. We are witnesses to the one who came and lived among us. We are witnesses of this, that God's grace has been poured out into us. 
We've been rebirthed and renewed and given life, born again and brought to life. And the second work of this grace of God is that God's grace pours out through us to the world. That God wants to fill you as you empty yourself and invite his spirit to be your life, that he will bring you to life and then he will bring life to others. So maybe for some of us, today's the day to step into faith in a different way. Maybe like Wesley, it's, it's just been about going through the motions. You've been in church your whole life, but it's never, you're still kind of sitting on the fence. You haven't stepped into life. You haven't invited him to really pour his life into you. I wanna invite you to do that today. This is the day you can step into that. Or maybe you found yourself stuck in, in life. You know, your faith used to mean something to you and you find you're in a dry desert place and, and you want the spirit to move again and renew you and restore you again. Or, or you want to step into a life where you can bless others. I wanna invite you to respond to however God is leading you today. So will you bow your heads with me? Friends, as a church, let's, let's not try to mix our world with Jesus' way but let's live Jesus' way. The way that draws near to others. The way that surrenders everything to him to follow him. The way that knows purpose and significance by emptying ourselves so that he can be exalted and lifted high. If you're sitting on the fence today, maybe this is Jesus' voice, the spirit. You hear it, don't neglect it. Don't turn from it but come and allow the Spirit to pour out on you. Maybe there's a, there's a healing that hasn't come that you've been longing for. Maybe there's an answer to a doubt. Maybe there's a renewal that you need. Invite his Spirit even now. I believe he's in this place, and I believe that wherever you are listening to these words, that his Spirit can bring you to life. You see, the truth is, we are lost, but for the grace of God. And so today, you can empty yourself, you can submit your will to him, you can simply say, God, I give up trying to do this myself. I wanna make you savior, I wanna make you Lord today. Invite his spirit to pour out upon you. To pour out through you to those around you to bless the world. We invite you, Lord, as we respond to your word to transform us, to renew us, to make us new, to make us one with you. Help us, Lord, to live this out, not just to hear these words, but to put them into practice. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Through this series, we're invite, inviting you to commit yourself to Christ um, by pouring out to your